Welcome to the fourth class on power electronics and distributed generation. So, in the last class we started looking at uh, the distribution systems uh, more closely. We are looking at uh, models of the components on the distribution system. We looked at uh, transformer model, the line model and we are discussing the fault model. So, we looked at the value of the fault impedances that uh, would could be used in uh, the system. So, if you have a uh, over current of uh, at least twice the value for the rated for the given section, then uh, potentially uh, protective devices can start operating. So, you are talking about uh, fault impedances starting from a dead shot corresponding to z f equal to 0 to larger values of z f, but uh, uh, it has to be uh, a small value of z f compared to 1 uh, to have the appropriate level of current, so that you could actually initiate uh, protective devices. One thing to consider when you are uh, looking at uh, uh, the fault current uh, models in uh, power systems uh, and distribution system traditional protection application. Uh, when you are talking about uh, current levels, voltage levels, you are talking about things in uh, RMS time frame. So, if you look at the instantaneous currents, it might be going, uh, going in a sinusoidal manner. Uh, that is what your uh, ideal uh, uh, voltage is a sinusoidal voltage, ideally your current is a sinusoidal current and uh, its value is going from a peak to a negative peak going through 0. But if you look at it on an envelope basis or, a, or on an RMS basis, say if you have a fault, then on an RMS basis you could think about the current level increasing. So, when people talk about instantaneous protection in a, a power systems basis, you are talking about uh, uh, three, uh, two, 2 to 5 cycles uh, time frame. And so, you are talking about uh, um, tens of milliseconds. So, you are talking about 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds going up to maybe 100 milliseconds and it is not the instantaneous time that uh, the students in power electronics are typically looking at where for a power semiconductor device, uh, you are talking about uh, switches that can operate in uh, microsecond or in uh, tens of nanoseconds. So, the instantaneous from the power electronics perspective and the instantaneous from the power systems perspective, uh, one has to keep the appropriate time frame in mind when you are looking at uh, how the systems respond. Uh, uh, when you are talking about instantaneous trip of a circuit breaker, you are talking about uh, uh, 1 to 3 cycles uh, rather than microsecond level and on an on a inst instantaneous basis. Uh, from the power electronics perspective, your, your actual waveform might be a sinusoid, uh, when, whereas if you are looking at the on an RMS basis, you can think of it as uh, uh, a, a, a slowly varying quantity, which can vary on a cycle to cycle basis and depending on the RMS values, you would decide on whether to open a breaker or uh, keep the breaker closed. Uh, so, you have to keep the time frame in mind when you are actually discussing the protection level in uh, these systems. So, another model that uh, uh, we would then look at is uh, what would be the appropriate uh, model for uh, 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 power converters in DG applications. So, the simplest uh, power conversion uh, device that you could have for distributed generation is actually an electric machine and quite commonly a synchronous machine is used and given the large number of gensets that are out there, 
The synchronous machine is an important component to consider for uh, what could be a, a power conditioning system or a interconnection uh, power conversion device that is being used in DG application. So, if you look at a synchronous machine, you can think for of it as a, a voltage behind the impedance model that would, would be considered. Uh, again, what the impedance is de depends on the time frame of analysis that uh, you would consider and uh, you would be familiar with uh, terms such as uh, your stator uh, inductance or your, your D axis and your Q axis uh, in, uh, impedance of the machine on for, for salient pole machines that you would consider for your steady state analysis. Uh, if you are looking at uh, shorter time frames, you have your transient inductances, you can have for much shorter time frames subtransient inductance. So, your transient inductance might be of the time frame of uh, maybe a second or so, your subtransient inductance could be of the order of uh, a cycle or a couple of cycles. So, depending on the time frame you are looking at, you could look at uh, different impedances. Uh, for the machine. Uh, so, if you are looking at typical parameters for these inductances, you are talking about uh, about 1.1 per unit. For excess, you are talking about uh, uh, about slightly larger impedance for your your direct axis uh, uh, impedance of. Uh, of a of a synchronous machine because your pole is facing that particular axis, your quadrature axis in case of a salient pole machine would have a smaller value of uh, impedance. Uh, but you can see that the numbers are quite large if you are looking at it on a steady state basis. Uh, whereas if you look at for shorter time frames where you might what you might be looking at for faults, you might be looking at uh, smaller value of impedances in the range of uh, say uh, uh, 0.2 per unit to 0.3 per unit for your transient uh, impedance and you might be talking about uh, 0.15 to 0.2 per unit for your uh, subtransient impedance. So, essentially whether it is a subtransient or a transient it depends on how deeply into the synchronous machine poles your flux is penetrating. Uh, for, so, for a sudden change in operation maybe your flux is penetrating just at the pole shoe level and you would have uh, time uh, your uh, di dynamic quantities die out in a shorter time frame. Whereas, if you are looking at uh, your damper windings etcetera it might take longer for your transients to die down. So, you are talking about uh, transient durations depending on the, the, the level of penetration of flux into the machine on a steady state basis you are looking at the D and Q axis impedances of the machine. Uh, another uh, aspect that is important especially when you are looking at distributed generation applications where you are looking at not just uh, 3 wire, but 4 wire situation is the zero sequence impedance of a, of a machine. Uh, the zero sequence impedance of a of a synchronous machine can be quite small of the order of uh, 1 percent or 0.1 per unit or yeah, it can be even smaller. Uh, essentially if you look at uh, uh, standard three phase windings on uh, uh, because the three windings are spatially displaced if you are applying equal currents in all the three phases which is what your zero sequence uh, component would do, then essentially the fluxes are trying to cancel each other. So, if you get very little flux with the application of current it means that your impedance is small. Okay. So, you end up with very small uh, impedances. So, you will end up with some unusual uh, situations for example, in a synchronous machine where your uh, uh, single line to ground faults or single phase faults might end up 
taking more current than a three phase fault. Okay. So, you end up with situations which uh, uh, are slightly unusual when you have situations such as this. If you look at uh, If you look at uh, say a induction machine, uh, which could be another component which is used as a, a interconnection device between your uh, distributed generation source and the, the electric grid. And if you look at your impedance, you are talking about a impedance of about uh, 0.15 to 0.2 per unit. And, uh, if you look at the value of the uh, the inductance or uh, inductance value that is used, it's essentially the leakage inductance of the machine, the sum of the uh, stator and the rotor leakage inductance. Uh, if you if you look at how much current would enter an induction machine when you do a direct online start, a uh, common number that people would consider is uh, you would take the five times the rated current as your uh, as your starting current of the machine and the reason is uh, quite simple. You have 1 per unit of voltage and your leakage in, uh, inductance is what limits the current. So, that is having a value of 0.2 per unit, you will end up with uh, 5 times 5 per unit of starting current in an induction machine. So, for again uh, for fault application, uh, when you have a fault uh, on a short term basis, the induction machine would uh, contribute about uh, 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 5 per unit fault, but again the flux in the machine would decay down. So, it will not last for a long duration of time, but your initial currents could be of this particular order of magnitude. If you look at uh, power electronic converter based uh, uh, power conditioning interconnection. A uh, typical power converter that is used to, uh, uh, to connect with the grid is a, is a current regulated uh, power converter. So, you would be doing current control to ensure the quality of current is a sinusoid. You may want to ensure that uh, uh, the, the power, the current that you are injecting is in phase in the voltage. So, that you get unity power factor. So, often you will have uh, uh, current regulation. So, you might be able to model your converters current injection as that of a current source. However, uh, if you look at the converters that are available today, uh, if you have a large transient in the grid, for example, the grid voltage suddenly collapses down or if there is a big uh, uh, surge in the grid voltage where the value of the voltage goes up, uh, many power converters would just trip and shut down. So, uh, large transients Unless uh, you specifically design your converter to actually handle this uh, large transients in the grid, uh, your converter would shut down. But being able to handle the uh, large grid transients is actually uh, emerging uh, requirement and it is already a requirement for many applications such as wind energy, where uh, if you have low voltage in the grid. Uh, you have to have a power converter which is able to ride through the low voltage. So, you have things like uh, low voltage ride through, fault uh, zero voltage ride through, fault ride through characteristics etcetera, which become more and more important for power converters. And again, when you are talking about fault, you are talking about time durations of the order of uh, tens to hundreds of uh, milliseconds.
So, your power converter will have to be able to operate for the hundreds of milliseconds when a fault has occurred in the power system and you have extreme imbalances or under voltage levels and the power converter should operate through that situation without actually shutting down so that it can come back into operation when once the grid gets back to normal. Okay. So, another uh, the thing that we will consider next after considering the power conditioning uh, devices which can be machines or power converters is uh, what sort of protection equipment would uh, be uh, be uh, there on a typical distribute, uh, distribution system. So, if you are looking at protection equipment, you are looking at uh, 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 over voltage protection or over current protection. So, if you are looking at over voltage uh, protection, you are looking at uh, things such as uh, surge arresters. So, the type of surge arresters that you would use in uh, your uh, equipment depends on your distribution system. So, for example, whether your transformers are uh, solidly grounded or impedance grounded. So, for example, if you have solidly grounded uh, 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 transformers, it means that your neutral shift when you have a fault would be small. So, you could have lower margins for your surge arresters, whereas if you have impedance grounding, uh, your neutral could potentially shift by a larger amount, which means that your surge arrestor would need to have higher uh, voltage margins. If you are looking at uh, over current protection, uh, you are looking at uh, uh, devices such as fuses, circuit breakers or relays. And uh, if you look at uh, the way the protection is being would be done in such devices, you would have uh, you could have thermal, which is essentially thermal uh, uh, overcurrent protection in a fuse. It can be uh, 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 electromagnetic, in, um, uh, in a circuit breaker you could have digital trip units. in a relay package, especially newer relay packages come with uh, uh, quite sophisticated digital trip units. And uh, each of these things, if for example, a digital trip unit has to be backward compatible with what is already there in the system. So, you cannot make your digital trip unit uh, respond as fast as your processor can calculate, but your your digital trip unit should be able to emulate the type of characteristic that is there in a thermal overcurrent protection or the electromechanical uh, relay so as to have the backward compatibility. So, your newer protection device should be able to operate with your older older protective devices. Okay. So, that is an important aspect of uh, power system. You cannot say every fuse has to be replaced by a newer device. So, whatever newer equipment that you are uh, bringing in has to be compatible with your equipment that is already there in the system. Again, as, uh, 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 as I mentioned, your instantaneous trips have to be uh, on uh, is actually on an RMS basis rather than on a real time instantaneous basis that we would consider or, or on a waveform. Uh, so, you are lock, talking about uh, number of cycles to trip even when you are talking about instantaneous. Okay. So, if you look at a fuse, for a fuse you are talking about uh, 
uh, essentially thermal uh, coordination and you are selecting your fuse based on uh, uh, based on its uh, the, the point at which your fuse would start melting. So, so you are depending on the fuse melt curve. Okay. So, if you are looking, uh, if you are thinking about uh, a fuse operating at some nominal current levels, the power dissipation in the fuse would be such that it would not heat up to the point where it would melt, but once it goes above some, uh, some critical value, your fuse will melt depending on the amount of current that is causing dissipation in the fuse. Uh, so, you are looking at your melt curve to determine at what point it would melt depending on what current level is actually going through the fuse. Uh, the fuses are actually quite uh, reliable, it is low cost. And reliable, because there is nothing complicated where you, you have, you do not do any sensing and uh, evaluation of your algorithm if the current is more it melts. So, it is quite simple which lends itself to uh, reliable operation. Okay. But uh, you have other con concerns that uh, if you have a three phase system, uh, the over current might actually cause uh, the fuse in one phase to melt and not all three phases. So, you could have uh, single facing of lines, uh, you could have, you will not be able to ensure that all fuses simultaneously operate. So, you might end up with situations where uh, some loads would could potentially face problems when you are actually having fuse as the only protective devices. Okay. Single facing is a concern and every time a fuse blows it has to be replaced. So, Yes, the replacement is a concern, whereas in a circuit breaker, you have a trip, you could reset it and get back to operation. Uh, because it is low cost uh, and uh, 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 and quite reliable, uh, often uh, it can be used in, uh, it is used in the end of the system where uh, cost is very critical, uh, closer to the uh, end of your distribution uh, radial structure or it can be used as a backup protection. Uh, say, if you are taking a circuit breaker and you want to have backup overcurrent protection for your breaker or a relay, then you could use a fuse to provide backup protection in case your breaker is not operating. Okay. So, your fuse would not typically melt because the breaker would typically operate. In case it fails, you now have a backup protection. If you look at uh, 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 the next device, which is commonly used in uh, 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 for overcurrent protection, it is a circuit breaker. And if you look at the circuit breakers that are available, there are. Uh, uh, bimetallic circuit breakers which operate on a thermal basis, you have electromagnetic circuit breakers, you are many uh, large uh, uh, larger size of breakers available today have uh, electronic trip units which actually operate to decide on whether the breaker should open or stay closed. So, you could have different uh, control packages to actually operate the breaker. So, the actual breaker is a device which would uh, make or break the current, okay. whether it is whether it should open or close is de decided by your trip unit. Okay. So, if you look at the ratings of the uh, breaker, uh, you will have both your voltage ratings so and your current ratings. So, your voltage rating needs to be based on your 
based on the voltage level at which you would operate. So, whether it is uh, uh, two, 230 volts, 415 volts, uh, uh, 690 volts, depending on your application, you would have voltage rating, uh, the voltage at which you are expecting your breakers to operate. Uh, the other uh, item that uh, is uh, important is uh, also your isolation voltage. voltage level where essentially if you have a voltage spike coming across the circuit breaker or on uh, for from one point to your frame which might be connected to your cabinet etcetera. You also have uh, iso isolation voltage level where having opened what voltage it can withstand before things arc over. Okay. So, your isolation voltage is also an important parameter of your breaker. So, often for many volt, low voltage uh, circuits, you would need isolation voltages level of at least uh, uh, twice your rated voltage plus uh, some margin on an RMS basis. So, that uh, even if you are talking about uh, uh, voltage level at which it would operate, uh, your ability to isolate has to be much higher than the ability at which you actually operate. Okay. If you look at your current rating, the current rating of your circuit breaker, there are couple of uh, important current ratings that need to be considered. One is uh, if you select any device what is the current at which it would typically operate. So, uh, if you are using a, a circuit breaker which is getting connected to a, a 10 amp circuit or a 15 amp circuit, you need to have at least the capability of 10 or 15 amps. So, that the breaker does not overheat under uh, normal uh, loading conditions. The second uh, aspect of the current rating which is important is so, you uh, uh, use a 10 amps or a 20 amps circuit breaker, but when there is a fault downstream of the circuit breaker, your actual current fault current is much higher. It could go up to hundreds of amps, thousands of amps. So, how much current can it actually interrupt? So, okay. so the interrupt rating of your circuit breaker is also an important parameter. Uh, so, Uh, so, so if you look at uh, uh, the aspect there, so there are multiple issues that you would need to look at before you select a circuit breaker, how it is used and what would be the con fault conditions at under which it has to protect your actual uh, load. Uh, if you think about a circuit breaker, it is uh, a form of a switch. Okay. So, it is a switch that is on or off. Uh, but if you look at what is what are the different varieties of switches that are out there, breakers imply you have the ability to interrupt fault. Okay, whereas a normal switch may not have the ability to interrupt a fault. So if you are using a contactor in a power electronic application, it can carry rated current. It may be able to switch off your nominal current level, but it will not be able to interrupt a fault current level. So if you try to interrupt fault current level using just a regular contactor, your contactor contacts would uh, could can potentially melt. Okay. So, you need the structures of your circuit breaker to actually uh, provide the appropriate arc impedance in your circuit breaker and ability to extinguish the arc and dissipate the energy in the arc. So, you need uh, more extensive structures in a circuit breaker compared to a, a regular switch if you are looking at just a isolation switch, you are looking at the ability to maintain isolation voltage, 
you are not even looking at the ability to interrupt load current. Okay. So, depending on the type of switch that is being used, you would have different levels of complexity. So, because the ability of the circuit breaker is for application which is intended to handle much higher uh, fault conditions, your circuit breaker would be more expensive than just a contactor. So, if uh, something is designed to handle much more challenging situations, you would have associated costs with it. So, depending on what you are intending that particular switch to be applied in, you have to make use of the appropriate variety of switch. If you look at a relay, you can think about the relay as essentially the control package which governs whether the switch needs to open or close and for overcurrent uh, protection you are looking at a uh, overcurrent relay. So, essentially the relay is a device which initiates whether to trip the breaker or uh, some breakers have abilities to reclose or close. So, the relays can actually give such commands to a circuit breaker. And, uh, tripping or opening. Relays tend to be uh, more expensive. So, it is uh, newer uh, relays are uh, that are available today are mostly electronic uh, relays. Uh, so, with a relay now you can actually trip all three phases. So, So, you can actually ensure that all the phases get disconnected simultaneously. Okay. It can be made more sensitive and depending on your algorithm, it can be made to respond in a rapid fast manner and uh, it is possible to implement uh, many uh, sophisticated functions like directional impedance evaluations etcetera. So, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the newer relays that are available are multifunctional relays, uh, they are uh, often called uh, intelligent electronic devices IED uh, and can be used uh, with a, uh, in a variety of situations. So, if you look at uh, 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 another protective device which could be used in uh, 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 a distribution system, uh, one can think about say uh, a recloser. So, essentially uh, the, the idea behind a recloser is that uh, uh, many faults are uh, large number of faults are temporary. So, uh, you can uh, if you are able to open the de-energize your line for a short duration and the fault clears, then when you re-energize it you can go back to a normal operation. Uh, without physically someone going there and uh, in, uh, having some manual intervention. Uh, so, if you are able to open your circuit breaker for some time and once the fault is cleared, you close it again, you can potentially uh, continue normal operation. But if you have say for example, a situation where you have something where there is permanent damage, then when you reclose again you end up with a overcurrent and so you might try a few times to actually reclose and at some point you decide that yes this is actually a permanent fault then you stay logged out okay so uh, 
essentially you would have reclosers or essentially you can think of it as a circuit breaker with a relay package which can actually close uh, reclose a number of times. You can have uh, a programmable number of reclose cycles say 1 to 4 reclose cycles are could be commonly used. And uh, again for thinking about how what the sequence of operation is, you uh, it would be good to think in terms of the RMS current levels when you have a fault. So, in this example over here, uh, what is shown is the recloser status either it is uh, closed when in say here when the logic is indicated high and it is open when the logic is indicated low. So, if or initially it was closed and things were under normal conditions and say you have a fault at some instant uh, say T naught. So, at this particular instant say you en uh, had a fault which causes caused your current to actually uh, come up to a uh, large extent uh, to a higher level then in a short duration maybe on an instantaneous basis depending on uh, you would actually open your, uh, uh, your recloser. So, after opening the recloser you wait for some duration and then uh, where your recloser is in the off condition and the line is de-energized and then you reclose. And you have two possible scenarios over here, one is the fault has cleared in which case you go into a current level in this hatched area and you continue operation in the hatched uh, in this hatched zone. A second situation is maybe the fault uh, did not get cleared by this initial pulse of current. So, when you re-energize you go back to the fault condition. So, your current level continues at the high fault current level itself and again now you wait for a certain close duration and then you again open your, your recloser. So, you could think about uh, say uh, uh, durations you might uh, call it as you can give names for these durations. And so, once you have opened again when there is a, a fault seen during this first reclose cycle, uh, you again wait for some time and you open the breaker and so under this open condition there is no current flowing and here now you try to close for a second time. So, the anticipation is now you have reclosed for a second time you potentially have cleared the fault. So, you might go back to normal operation or in case you have something really solid on the feeder then uh, causing a fault then you go back to your high current level uh, you wait for some more duration and then you will lock out. So, at this point if the fault is still continuing your recloser will will uh, lock out and stop further reclose attempts. So, this is a recloser with two reclose cycles. So, you have one opening a second opening and then it would lock out if the fault is permanent and if the fault is temporary now it has two chances to get back to normal after the first reclose cycle or the second reclose cycle. Okay. So, uh, so, you can see that uh, if you have a temporary fault on this particular feeder, uh, it would get cleared with minimal uh, disturbance and you would uh, you could re-energize and go back to normal operation. So, if you think about the recloser, it can be thought of as a, a, a circuit breaker and the circuit breaker might have its own uh, time over current characteristics and the circuit breaker might also have a program to actually execute this reclose action. Okay. And if you are having already relays in the substation, you can actually now incorporate this reclose uh, logic along with uh, the feeder circuit breakers sitting at the substation. So, you could look at uh, improving the power quality or the time uh, of uptime of your feeder uh, when there are potentially faults on the feeders. Okay. And the uh, this logic can be easily uh, incorporated into your substation protection logic. So, if you look at uh, uh, another item that we had mentioned we had also mentioned uh, sectionalizers uh, 
So, a section lyser is a device which is intended to operate uh, along with a recloser. So, suppose you have a feeder coming from a substation. So, you have a, a feeder and you have branches or uh, laterals on this feeder and say you locate your uh, your uh, your sectionalizer on this particular lateral and uh, you want to actually uh, 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 say isolate this particular lateral uh, uh, when there is a fault on the lateral rather than de-energize the entire feeder. Okay. So, we will see how it can potentially be done. So, suppose you have a uh, uh, a fault on this particular lateral uh, downstream of the sectionalizer. Uh, what the sectionalizer does is it would count the number of fault current pulses and uh, it can shut down uh, or lock open uh, after counting a given number of pulses, pulses, current pulses flowing through it. Okay. So, in this case we will again assume that your up, upstream recloser has uh, two reclose cycles and you have a fault at this particular location downstream of this uh, on this particular lateral. So, uh, you have multiple situations if this particular uh, fault was a temporary fault then this recloser uh, which was initially closed would after its first opening you potentially if this fault cleared you can go back to normal operation Not, nothing would change on your uh, your recloser or the sectionalizer. Suppose you have uh, uh, this recloser with two reclose cycles and say this sectionalizer is counting for two current pulses. Okay. So, in this particular case you have say a permanent fault occurring at this particular location and at the initiation of fault at time t naught you end up with one current pulse flowing through the sectionalizer. At the end of your first uh, during your first reclose cycle you end up with now a second pulse now flowing through this particular sectionalizer and then uh, through this particular sectionalizer and then the recloser opens. So, when the recloser opens essentially the sectionalizer would count now two cycles and lock open. So, when the recloser now recloses for a third time the sectionalizer is open which means that this uh, feeder can go back to normal operation and this lateral has actually opened and got disconnected where you have the permanent fault. So, you can see that there are two things that are happening over here. The logic for it is not complex because you are just comparing current pulses rather than doing more complex uh, time over current characteristic. The second thing is the X section lyser is opening when the recloser is uh, open which means that you just need a simple uh, contactor type of switch rather than a circuit breaker. So, it can it is interrupting at low current levels or zero, uh, ideally at zero current levels. So, you could have a lower cost device uh, as a section lyser. So, in this particular case you had a two cycle recloser and you had a section lyser which counted two pulses and locked open. So, you isolate this particular lateral and you go back to normal operation. Section lysers need not just be on laterals it can also be on really long feeders you may want to section lyse the tail end of the feeder and the front end of the feeder. So, you could have different configurations you could also have chain of section lysers you could have section lyser 1, section lyser 2 depending on how you are connecting your laterals. There are other simple uh, protective devices that are used in uh, the distribution system. Uh, you can have uh, fused disconnects, uh, jumpers etcetera. Essentially, they are isolation devices uh, which are open before a uh, lineman comes and uh, works on the particular uh, feeder or uh, before the person does any repair, uh, repair, repair work on the distribution system. <coughs> so, that, so, so, if you now look at uh, more closely at uh, 
what is the characteristic that uh, one would need when you are looking at uh, protection uh, in terms of uh, a fuse or a circuit breaker, you are looking at the time over current characteristic of your protective device. and you are looking at uh, fuses, circuit breakers, relays etcetera. And so, with a fuse you are looking at uh, the fuse of uh, the appropriate voltage rating uh, at which it would uh, interrupt uh, the current and you are also looking at your current rating of the fuse, the nominal current at which uh, the fuse would be expected to operate depending on the downstream loads connected to it and also the interrupt capacity of the fuse. So, you have fuses of different interrupt capacities, you have some fuses which uh, might need to interrupt high currents like uh, HRC fuses, high rupture capacity fuses etcetera. So, depending on the type of uh, uh, requirement you would need to use the appropriate time, uh, type of fuse and aspects of it that are important is what is your minimum melt time so the time required for the fuse to melt uh, depends on a uh, uh, couple of things one is what is the temperature at which it was nominally operating so if it was initially operating at a elevated temperature it can actually uh, melt quick uh, more quickly okay uh, another aspect which is important is uh, how much current level is there because it is the I square R losses in the fuse which uh, dissipates energy into the fuse and causes the fuse to melt. Uh, if you think of it as a, a adiabatic process which means that energy is going in it is not dissipating outside then uh, essentially you would have be looking at what is the minimum melt time. Similarly, you would have a characteristic of what is the maximum clearing time how much would be the maximum time before which the fuse can actually be considered open. Okay. Uh, another uh, aspect of the fuse which is important is uh, suppose you have a, a fuse and you have some uh, overcurrent flowing through that particular fuse and uh, the overcurrent is for a short duration and uh, before it melts the overcurrent went away then how does the fuse return back to the normal condition. Okay. So, you also have the cooling time constant where uh, yeah, the uh, fuse heated up to some extent then uh, it cooled, cools down depending on your thermal time constant of the particular fuse. So, essentially you can think about the cooling time constant as uh, some sort of a reset mechanism of the fuse where it got exposed to uh, over current and when the current went away it cools down and resets back to normal operation. If you look at uh, circuit breakers Uh, you are looking at now uh, uh, something people refer to as the IDMT characteristics or uh, uh, inverse definite mean time characteristic. Essentially, it means that uh, larger the current, you will uh, take a short duration for your circuit breaker to operate. If your current level is small, then it would take a longer duration to operate. Uh, but even at very high current levels there is some fixed delay before which uh, your circuit breaker will not operate. Okay. So, if you look at it from your uh, uh, tripping characteristics of your circuit breaker you can think of uh, a, a critical level as a pickup current level. If your current is greater than the pickup current level uh, 
then you are uh, you would be initiating tripping action in the breaker. If your current is below your pickup current level, you will be uh, having reset action going on in the breaker. Okay. And you can define a ratio between your actual current and your pickup current and depending on this ratio m, uh, your uh, circuit breaker would operate uh, uh, with a given speed. So, for tripping the uh, your value of m has to be greater than 1 and your time to trip can be expressed as an expression say a divided by m to the power of p minus 1 plus b. So, this would could uh, emulate the, the, the IDMT type of characteristics. Similarly, for when m is less than 1 you would have a reset time uh, can be again expressed as some cons uh, T R E divided by m to the power of p minus 1 at the absolute value of it. And if uh, you are operating close to uh, 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 your nominal current level and if your nominal current level is much smaller than your pickup current level then m can be considered close to 0. So, you could take your reset time to be approximately given by your capital T R E. So, you could take up consider your, uh, your reset time to be roughly constant just from to simplify your analysis. Okay. For m close to 0 your T R E is uh, roughly constant. Okay. And in these expressions your A uh, P, B, etcetera are constants, your T R E, these are constants depending on the type of characteristic you are trying to emulate in your circuit breaker. Okay. So, depending on the value of your A, uh, B, P, etcetera, you can have uh, different uh, definitions of what would be your, uh, your uh, your uh, inverse current uh, characteristics. So, I, IEC defines uh, uh, circuit breakers uh, which are moderately inverse, very inverse, extremely inverse etcetera uh, uh, for, for the time current characteristic. Okay. So, a, a, a good reference for this would be uh, IEEE uh, standard uh, C37. Dash one one two, which is uh, the inverse time current characteristics for overcurrent relays. So, so the type of curves are essentially if you have a very a large value for the multiplier, essentially the time required to trip is quite small. So, if you are value of the multiplier which is uh, uh, m which is the ratio of your actual current by your pickup current is a sm smaller number closer to 1 it would take a longer time to trip. So, if you now plot it on a log log scale it would have look as curves uh, which are shown over here. Okay. So, for your uh, uh, for your extreme and very inverse type of characteristics essentially you could consider uh, p approximately 2 and the the expression for your trip time can be written as uh, uh, assuming your b is small essentially the definite time is small and for again for m which is much larger than 1, uh, you could take this as uh, approximately a by So, if you uh, so you know that a uh, your m is your ratio of your uh, your actual current by your pickup current. So, if you substitute that, uh, 
So, at this point what we will do is we will uh, wrap up this particular se session. Mm -hmm.